Please be seated. Let's pray. O Lord of light, lift all our hearts today. O Lord of truth, lift every Christian soul. O Lord of love, lift every Christian heart. And may our hearts respond in full accord. Amen. What sort of things go through your mind when you read the Bible or hear it read? In our first reading, we heard two men went up to the temple to pray. And I'm thinking, that sounds like the beginning of a joke. (laughs) Two men. And then we hear two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. And I'm thinking, okay, it's not a joke. This is a compare and contrast story. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. And I immediately condemn myself by thinking, God, I'm glad I'm not like that Pharisee. (laughs) In our second reading, we heard two men again, one with a speck in his eye and the other with a plank. And I'm thinking, boy, Jesus must have made them laugh out loud with that scenario. And once again, I immediately condemn myself by thinking, gee, I'm glad I never have a plank in my eye. As we read, and especially as we teach, for those of us who teach the Bible regularly, we can very easily begin to identify ourselves automatically with the goodies. We can easily fall into the trap of being confident in our own righteousness and of looking down on others, just like the Pharisee who looked down on the tax collector in Jesus' parable. It's easily done because we tend to be extremely good at comparing the best of ourselves with the worst of others. The Apostle James gives us an early insight into what Jesus was getting at when he said, do not judge. James 4, verses 11 to 12. Brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. When you judge the law, you're not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. There is only one lawgiver, And one judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? James warns us that when we begin to judge or condemn others, we're setting ourselves up as the ones who determine what is right or wrong and who is right and who is wrong. And in doing so, where you're usurping the role of God. Now, of course, we all know that we shouldn't judge people. But on the other hand, we all know very well that judging is part and parcel of everyday lives, of our everyday lives. And isn't the Sermon on the Mount itself really teaching on how to judge what is true righteousness from what is not? Jesus uses illustrations of good and bad practice to help his disciples learn to judge between the two. So what sort of uh, judging is it that Jesus is condemning? The answer John Wesley gave uh, to that question was this. The judging that Jesus condemns here is thinking about another person in a way that is contrary to love. Judging is like acid to love. It corrodes it. It's easy to make the connection here to the golden rule that follows in verse 12. In everything, that includes judging, do to others what you would have them do to you. 
or put negatively, don't do to others what you don't want them to do to you. Well, all things are either good, bad, or indifferent, and we've got to judge between them. That's moral discernment, and that's a good thing. Indeed, without that process, we could never determine what action is in other people's best interests, or in other words, what action is the most loving. Just because reading the Bible helps us see things from God's perspective doesn't mean we gain the elevation required to look down on anyone. And so as disciples of Jesus, we must never sit in judgment over others in personal condemnation. It's interesting, Jesus achieves um, something quite complex with this seemingly simple illustration. He creates self-awareness that leads to self-judgment, that leads to humility, which in turn leads to repentance and sanctification, which then leads to the kind of humility that treats others, uh, other sinners with mercy. And when that process is multiplied in the lives of all his disciples, it creates a kingdom society shaped not by condemnation, but by humility, love, and forgiveness. And who doesn't want to live in a society like that? Bring it on. But how can we go about bringing it on? Well, of course, we've got to heed Christ's sobering warning. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Using a severe standard will be disastrous for us because we will be paid back in our own measure. And not just in terms of divine judgment. We all know that when we point the finger at someone, there are four fingers pointing back at us. We all know how criticism provokes criticism similar to itself. And so constructive criticism will promote constructive criticism. Destructive criticism will provoke destructive criticism. Many years ago, I heard a preacher talking on this subject and uh, I've never forgotten what, how he encouraged his congregation to be binders. Uh, a binder is someone who builds others up, not down. Can you imagine the difference this would make in families and workplaces across our nation? Can you imagine the difference it would make in our parliament Just ponder that for a moment. <laughs> I think they could spend more time with their families. <laughs> or am I being judgmental in saying that? Anyway, let's move on. Let's move on to verse 6, which doesn't appear to be connected in any particular way to what comes before or after. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Dogs and pigs were the derogatory terms used widely by Jews to refer to Gentiles. And all of Jesus' hearers would have immediately, immediately made that connection. Remember that this is before Jesus had broken down the wall separating Gentiles from Jews. God's people were set apart, holy, as God is set apart, holy. Gentiles were not set apart. They were accordingly unholy. God's people were to know and honor the difference. But what is Jesus getting at in this verse? The structure of the verse helps us understand that pigs belong together with trample, while the turn and tear belong together with dogs. 
Dogs and pigs have no sense of value. Dogs will rip apart precious items. I know only too well, having had two Labrador puppies. Pigs will trample on them. In the same way, those who despise the sacred kingdom of God will trample underfoot the precious pearl of the gospel, the good news about Jesus. Often this verse is interpreted as meaning that we shouldn't waste our efforts sharing the gospel with people who don't want to know. But it's probably more likely to be a simple prohibition. In the gospels, Jesus tells his disciples not to preach the gospel to the Gentiles for the time being. In this verse, he's telling them in metaphorical terms what he would say again in more direct terms when he sent them out. Don't yet evangelize the Gentiles. They aren't ready for it. Go first to our fellow Jews. It's a simple prohibition that applied until after the resurrection. The great commission that comes in the last chapter of Matthew's gospel would eventually unleash the mission to the Gentiles at Pentecost. The church today is uh, very much a Gentile church rather than a Jewish church. This verse then ran its course and now belongs to a period of history, the two to three years of Jesus' public ministry prior to Pentecost. That That said, we can still learn from it. It might encourage us to focus our gospeling energies on those closest to us, on those who are in our orbit, on those with whom we have natural connections, on those three friends we're going to be praying for in the run-up to Hope 25. And if you haven't grabbed one of these cards, do grab one from the pew in front of you and start uh, praying for those three friends. This approach fits with the way the Apostle Paul operated. He was a zealous missionary, but he always began on his home turf at the synagogue with his fellow Jews. It also fits with Jesus' approach too. He began with his own people and encouraged others to follow suit. Well, as you can see, Matthew has brought together a rather eclectic collection of teachings of Jesus in this part of his gospel. There's another change of topic in verse 7, where we come across four very familiar verses. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. And look at that. Isn't it handy the way the letters spell ask? The only problem is, though, it doesn't exist in the original Greek. (laughs) Although it comes very close. It's only one letter off. I'm sure many of you have heard before that the three verbs are present imperatives, which means we're to persist and not give up. But we've got to be careful here, because if we push the persistence idea too far, it can easily lead us to a faulty idea of how God relates to us. It can lead us to think that God is either tired or busy or perhaps uninterested in us, and so we have to goad him into action on our behalf, just like the persistent widow of Luke 18. But then on the other hand, if God was duty-bound to respond to our persistent persistence, wouldn't we undermine his sovereign free will? And so this text pushes us to think hard about what prayer is. Does it really make a difference? Does God change the course of history because we pray or don't pray? Does persistence pay off? Is God sovereign? Why does God answer prayer? Is it for his own glory or to form an interactive relationship with us? Well, Jesus' teaching here is shaped to speak to that struggle we have in prayer. 
It leads us to see that God is a father who is altogether good and therefore a God who will respond to his people when they pray. Tom Wright writes, For most of us, the problem is not that we're too eager to ask for the wrong things. The problem is that we're not eager enough to ask for the right things. Of course, Jesus wasn't naive. He knew that his own disciples prayed and didn't get what they wanted, as evidenced by what the Apostle James writes in his letter. Sorry. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. Most imp- and uh, most importantly, it can be said that Jesus himself prayed and didn't get what he asked for. If it is possible, take this cup from me. Jesus teaches that his disciples are to go to God, ask him, and expect him to respond. Why does he need to say this? Well, because the disciples aren't wondering how God will answer their prayers, but if he will. So verse 8 is not a promise that every, everything everyone asks for will be given. It's rather addressing doubting disciples who need to be assured that God indeed loves them and that they can trust him. Notice how Jesus, is, um, how Jesus anchors petition in God's goodness. He uses the father-son relationship in a how much more argument to illustrate his point. If we humans who are evil, and by that one commentator suggests the special vice of stinginess is in focus, if we're evil and yet still good enough to give good things to our children, how much more will God? Why? Because God is better than us and because God is altogether good. He creates orders, sustains, disciplines, elects, protects, guides, ransoms, saves, reconciles, and we could go on and on. So for both Jesus and James, God is good, and God gives nothing but good things. Six weeks ago, we read that uh, what Jesus claimed to have come to do. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Here in chapter 7, verse 12, Jesus implies that he has the authority to sum up the law and the prophets. And in just 15 Greek words, these are truly extraordinary claims. These are not the claims of someone who is just a great teacher. Jesus' golden rule reveals that he doesn't give either the legalist or the liberal a pat on the back. The legalist multiplies laws so as to cover all possible situations. The liberal seeks to reduce the law. Clearly, clearly the Old Testament shows the multiplication approach. And by the time of Jesus, groups like the Pharisees had multiplied the law with their own traditions. Jesus wasn't uncomfortable with the legal text of the Bible, but he reduced the Torah to its essence in just two points, loving God and loving others. In doing so, he sought to make the many laws more understandable and doable. Jesus didn't abolish the law, but fulfilled it by practicing what he preached all the way to the cross. Loving God and loving others is to do all the Torah, the law says, and more. Do to others what you would have them do to you, 11 very simple words in English 
But who would argue that putting them into practice in our everyday lives is the surest way of seeing individuals, families, societies, and even nations transformed by the power of God's love? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are altogether good and that you long to have us come to you with our prayers and petitions. We pray now that you would help us to trust you. Help us to be as severe with ourselves as we are critical of others. Help us to seek you. Help us to love others and to love you. For Jesus' sake, amen.